let's just look at exoplanets. Yeah. So that's a really interesting one. I think when you look back, you know, hundreds of years from now, what is it, in the 90s when they first detected 90, the yeah, first? 92 and 95. 95 to me was really, that was the discovery of the first planet orbiting a sun-like star. To me, that was the water, the dam being broken. I, I think that's like one of the greatest discoveries in the, in the history of science. I agree. I agree. Right now, I guess nobody's celebrating it too much because you don't know what it really means. But I think once we almost certainly will find life out there, it will obviously allow us to generalize across the entire galaxy, the entire universe. So if you can find life on a planet, even in the solar system, you can now start generalizing across the entire universe. You can. All you need is one. Like right now, it's an any, you know, our understanding of life, we have one example. We have N equals one example of life. So that means we could be an accident, right? It could be that we're the only place in the entire universe where this weird thing called life has occurred. Get one more example and now you're done. Because if you have one more example, now you're, you know, even, you know, you don't have to find all the other examples. You just know that it's happened more than once. And now you are, you know, in, from a Bayesian perspective, you can start thinking like, yeah, yeah, this is, life is not something that's hard to make. Well, let me get your sense of, uh, estimates for the Drake equation. You've also written a paper expanding on the Drake equation, but what, what, do you th what do you think is the answer? So the paper, there was this paper we wrote, uh, Woody Sullivan and I, in 2016, where we said, look, we have all this exoplanet data now, right? The, so the thing that exoplanet science and the exoplanet census I was talking about before have nailed is F sub P, the fraction of stars that have planets, it's one. Every freaking star that you see in the sky hosts a family of worlds. I mean, it's mind boggling because every one of those, those are all places, right? They're either, you know, gas giants, probably with moons. So there's the moons are places you can stand and look out or they're like terrestrial worlds where even if there's not life, there's still snow falling and there's oceans washing up on, you know, on shorelines. It's incredible to think how many places and stories there are out there. So, right, the first term was F sub P, which is how many stars have planets. The next term is how many planets are in the habitable zone, right, on average. And it turns out to be one over five, right? So, you know, you know, around 0.2. So that means you just count five of them. Go out at night and go one, two, three, four, five. One of them has an, an Earth-like planet, you know, in the habitable zone. Like, whoa. So what, what defines a habitable zone? Habitable zone is an idea um, that was developed in the... Um, uh, 1958 by the Chinese American astronomer Xu Shang, and it was it was a brilliant idea. It said, "Look, this is there. You know, I can do the simple calculation if I, I take a planet and just stick it at some distance from a star of what's the temperature of the planet, what's the temperature of the surface. So now you're all you're going to ask. You give it a standard kind of you know Earth like atmosphere and ask." Could there be liquid water on the surface, right? We believe that liquid water is really important for life. There could be other things that's happening, fine. But, you know, if you were to start off trying to make life, you'd probably choose water as your solvent for it. So basically, the habitable zone is the band of orbits around a star where you can have liquid water on the surface. You could take a you know glass of water, pour it on the surface, and it would just pool up. It wouldn't freeze immediately, which would happen if your planet is too far out, and it wouldn't just boil away if your planet's too close in. So that's the formal definition of the habitable zone. So it's a nice, strict definition. There's probably way more going on than that, but this is a place to start. Right. Well, we should say it's a place to start. I, I do think it's too strict of a constraint. I would agree. We're talking about <laughs> temperature where water can be on the surface. There, there's so many other ways to get uh, the aforementioned turmoil yeah. where the temperature varies, whether it's volcanic, uh, so interaction of volcanoes and ice and all of this on the moons of plants that are much farther away, all yeah. this kind of stuff. Yeah. Well, for example, we know in our own solar system, we have, say, Europa, the moon of Jupiter, which has got a hundred mile deep ocean under 10 miles of ice, right? That's not in the habitable zone. That is outside the habitable zone. And that may be the best place. It's got more water than Earth does. All of its oceans are, you know, it's twice as much water on Europa than there is on Earth. So, you know, that may be a really great place for life to form and it's outside the habitable zone. So, you know, the habitable zone is a good place to start and it helps us. And there's reason... There's reasons why you do want to focus on the habitable zone because like Europa, I couldn't, I won't be able to see from across telescopic distances, across light years. I, I wouldn't be able to see life on Europa because it's under 10 miles of ice, right? So with the important thing about 
um, planets in the habitable zone is that we're thinking they have atmospheres. Um, atmospheres are the things we can characterize for across 10, 50 light years, and we can see biosignatures as we're going to talk about. So there is a reason why the habitable zone becomes important for the detection of extrasolar life. But for me, when I look up at the stars, it's very likely that there's a habitable planet or moon in each of the stars, habitable defined broadly. Yeah, I think that's that's not unreasonable to say. I mean, especially since the the formal definition, you get one in five, right? One in five is a lot. There's a lot of stars in the sky. So yeah, saying that in general, when I look at a star, there's a pretty good chance that there's something habitable orbiting it is not a unreasonable scientific claim. 